welcome to my first lecture in, in, in this 2017-18 environmental series. I just want to say that I am again most grateful to the Frank Jackson Foundation for sponsoring the Professor of Environment role, and indeed to Gresham College too, who have extended my term of office for a fourth year. Tonight's lecture, as some of you will know, forms part of two series. My own lectures this year are going to consider six contested environmental issues, issues where alternative facts, post-truth positions, and downright lies have abounded. They include those other topics. They include organic farming, in which actually we're going to do a taste test, so if you want some free cookies, do come. Uh, that'll be the, the next one, I think. Uh, I'll also be talking about national parks, so-called eco-towns, green businesses, and returning for my, my very, what will be my very last lecture to my own favourite topic of, of flooding. I will be interrogating some of the claims made by various stakeholders to see if I can bring listeners a little closer to understanding the interplay of environmental challenges. And I will even, I think, slip in a little science under the wire. Tonight, I'm going to be looking at an issue of local residence to the, uh, to the audience here in Barnard's Inn Hall in London, the ever-changing quality of water in, in the River Thames, and the management that tries to ensure that the environment remains healthy. I'm going to be highlighting some of the current controversies and drawing parallels with what has happened in the past. However, my lecture also forms part of the Totally Thames Festival, a series of events including lectures, exhibitions, and walks that celebrate one of Britain's greatest and most historic rivers flowing through London, which is undoubtedly one of the world's greatest cities. Double value, I hope. I should add, perhaps slightly tongue-in-cheek, that I had thought I might up the online views by titling it A Dirty Story, but I, uh, I restrained myself. Now, for those unfamiliar with British geography, the River Thames drains a large, well, for the UK, a large catchment area in southern England. The non-tidal part of the river is about 245 kilometres long, and um, it ends at Teddington Weir. This is the tidal reach here. Uh, below Teddington Weir, which is above London, uh, there is another 30 kilometres or so of tidal waters that surge up and down through central London. The lower reaches are saline, of course, and on this Google slide you can see um, the estuary there with, uh, on, on the left-hand side with uh, lots of sediment in it. The lower reaches, as I said, are saline. Geologically, though, southern England is gradually sinking with respect to sea level, and it is believed that in Roman times the tides didn't reach the area that is now the city area of London. Um, yew tree remains remains of trees have been found, and yew trees are not tolerant of salt. So it's assumed that the tide did not come as far up in the past as it does today. Moreover, archaeology has established that the river was much wider and shallower then than it is today, allowing bridges to be constructed using simple technology, despite the fact that the channel shifted from time to time, and the presence of the Thames, of course, was the one of the principal reasons, certainly, why, uh, why London was constructed where it is. So there we see the, the catchment area, the whole catchment area. London is, uh, is around here, and this is actually the area that I'm going to be talking about today, principally. Uh, here's Teddington, and you do have to be aware, though, that above Teddington, there is a very large area um, uh, of England. Now... When we look at the lower reaches of the Thames, we see some stunning built landscapes. We'll go back. Um, we see scenery that reflects not only more than 2,000 years of riverside settlement, buildings, monuments, artworks, and so on, but also a natural corridor that is home to millions of shellfish, fish, birds, mammals, and the plants and microorganisms that underpin the food chain on which they depend. Notably today, we, we, uh, we are aware of oysters, eels, salmon, and seals. They're found there at least from time to time, and we'll have a look at that a bit later on. The Thames still presents a transport route for thousands of ships and smaller craft, 
and it provides recreational opportunities too. Again, something I'll return to in a minute. Overlaying onto that, the Thames has been, and still is, a ready source of human food. But it also acts as a foul drain for people's wastes, and has done so since the occupants of the earliest villages saw it as a very convenient way to dispose of their sewage. And the highly polluting effluents from their industries, things like butchery, tanning, dyeing, for example. Out of sea, or out to sea, out of mind, at least if the tide is favourable. Now, despite the sophistication of environmental and water science and a, uh, a European-driven regulatory regime that is said to be one of the tightest in the world, we still experience massive environmental problems with the Thames. The disgusting 19th century pollution will be familiar to many of you here because it was depicted not only in Charles Dickens' bleaker novels, but frequently in Punch magazine cartoons. No doubt some of you will be familiar with the engineering works that followed the so-called Great Stink of 1858 and which provided some much-needed relief from the stench of sewage to the riverside residents. However, the problem returned in the 20th century. Or perhaps it never truly went away. This is, this is a 19th century cartoon, of course. Perhaps it never truly went away, and it certainly persists today. Just a few months ago, in March this year, in 2017, the 21st century, Thames Water, the Australian-owned private company that now manages London's water supply and treats its waterborne wastes, was fined £20.3 million, the largest, fine, the largest ever fine for any company operating in the UK for inflicting catastrophic environmental damage on the Thames' ecosystems. According to the judgment, their deliberate and repeated releases of virtually untreated sewage directly into the river above London wiped out entire populations of fish and exposed people to health risks. The final straw was a release of 1.4 billion litres of raw sewage on one occasion, the impacts of which can be seen in the photograph here, and which brought the legal department of the England, England and Wales's Environment Agency down on them. This was not an exceptional event either, as they admitted scores of other offences. As the judge remarked, and I'm going to stick to what the judge said, rather than making my own particular interpretation, the judge said it should not be cheaper to offend than to take appropriate precautions. And I have to say, one cannot help thinking that Thameswater believed that the cost of any fine might have been expected to be less than the costs of sorting out the problem, as there seems to be little other explanation of their behaviour. Careless, possibly. <coughs> Apart from some such localised pollutant releases, after heavy rain, the Thames often experiences chemical and ecological shocks from pulses of poor quality water entering the mainstream through hidden and historic rivers, such as the formerly substantial River Fleet and the Tyburn and overflowing sewers too. Now, as we talk about that, you might want to keep this picture in mind. Many of you will probably have heard of um, many, many of you will probably have heard of uh, David Walliams' swim, David Walliams' marathon swim in the Thames, I think it was in 2012 or 2014, um, when he picked up some ghastly intestinal bug uh, from the river. Now, the Thames is not unique um, in this. Uh, 20, uh, 2016 saw the first national increases in the number of pollution events since, 19, uh, since 2012. What's happening is that water is entering the river, and we can see here, that, uh, this is a slightly earlier Google image where the river channel here, the mainstream river, is, uh, is very clear. River, uh, water, poor quality water is entering the mainstream through these hidden and historic rivers, such as the River Fleet, and the Tyburn, and through overflowing sewers as well. This is the management arrangements that are supposed to be covered by Thames Water. And Thames Water is a highly profitable monopoly. It yields very good dividends to its shareholders, 
and hence Londoners paying their water bills and faced with ever larger charges to cover massive new engineering works, for example, £25 per household per year for the new Thames Tideway Tunnel, a subject to which I'll return later, are asking whether the current management arrangements are fit for purpose. Will they deliver what Londoners, now known as customers, actually want for their water supply and their river? Indeed, the Labour Party conference this week has clearly indicated that in their view, they're not fit for purpose and that water companies will quickly be taken back into public ownership under a future Labour administration. Something still seems to be wrong with the Thames, which legislation, vast amounts of public and private expenditure and a great deal of experience have so far been unable to remedy. It was also very acutely demonstrated, exemplified, in something called the Human Race 2012 Hampton Court Swim. I don't know if any of you participated. Uh, I didn't actually like open water swimming, but I didn't do that one. It's a, 40, a very long distance, 14 kilometres, I think. But the hundreds of swimmers did participate in this open water event, and hundreds of them became ill subsequently with gastrointestinal problems. Indeed, some were hospitalised. Now, the water had supposedly been checked for pathogens and confirmed to be safe, but clearly it wasn't. Contamination had arrived suddenly and in large amounts in the main course of the river. Interestingly, actually, and I'm thinking about myself here largely, uh, age did afford some, pr uh, some protection. The over 40s were less likely to become ill, which is perhaps one of the few advantages of ageing that I can think of. OK, so... The history of human interaction with the Thames is a very complex one. I've already touched on the likely state of the Thames's channel in those Roman and pre-Roman times, but it probably remained fairly healthy, particularly as the local population decreased for a time after the fall of the Roman Empire. Little is known about its state over several centuries, but certainly by the 13th century, pollution of the river had become significant again. Domestic, industrial and human wastes at this time were generally disposed of in something called kennels or gutters along the side or the centre of unpaved roads or they were piled or it was piled in uncovered middens behind the houses. Unfortunately, of course, scavenging pigs, ravens and kites made for a rather unpleasant state of affairs and in uh, 1354, orders were made that kennel rubbish must be collected weekly and removed to the Essex marshes on pain of fines. It isn't recorded what the Essex or the residents of the Essex marshes thought about that. Um, but um, even so, after the rainfall, contaminated water would spread around and seep into the river. Edward III, making a journey down the Thames in 1357, apparently found the stench of the water so offensive that he besought the mayor and the sheriffs of London to forbid people to throw rubbish into the river and its tributaries. But although some of the immediate issues were resolved by this legislation and some blockages in some of these tributary rivers, he's uh, running into the Thames, and you have to remember then that the city was sort of more or less uh, just around here at that time, um, blockages were removed, but the overall position was not really addressed by the legislation. It was just widely ignored and anyway largely unenforceable. How do you know whose sewage it is that's in the river? So they had another go 200 years later. In 1531, a bill of sewers was initiated under Henry VIII's regime. He wasn't one to toy with. He passed some legislation in an attempt to speed rainfall away into the mainstream Thames and to prevent this spreading of human waste around people's living spaces. But again, it failed to address the fundamental problems of sewage washing into the estuary and its tributaries. This is a, a bit of a um, uh, writing by Ben Johnson who in, uh, in 1616. He was writing about an imaginary voyage along the River Fleet. Uh, formerly, the River Fleet was a very substantial and, in fact, navigable tributary of the Thames, whose name, of course, is memorialised in Fleet Street. And I do note that 
Others have on occasion referred to the printed product of Fleet Street as effluent, of course. Um, but uh, in his writing, he made reference to the disgusting odours stirred up by the mud, uh, from the mud by the oars of small boats. Uh, and he said, that belching forth, as it says up there, an air as hot as the muster of all your night tubs. And you can imagine what the contents of the night tubs might have been. The population then was about 200,000. And um, other poets also complained over the following years. Swift, for example, referred to sweepings from butchers' stalls, dung, guts and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprats, all drenched in mud, dead cats and turnip tops come tumbling down the flood. The situation was not helped by the fact that public latrines were permitted to be built over the smaller London rivers. And in fact, their flimsy timber supports were apparently often used as mooring posts by fishermen, sometimes with rather disastrous consequences of one sort or another. Now, some people have regarded the Great Fire of London as a cleansing event in 1666. And it certainly took some of the organic wastes out of circulation. <coughs> Former uh, Gresham College professors, Sir Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke, were instrumental in attempting to develop better systems for the management of London's rivers immediately afterwards, constructing new riverside structures to encourage some civic pride. The lower part of the fleet, for example, was turned into a sort of mini Venetian canal but unfortunately it failed to capture the public imagination and it was soon overwhelmed again by excrement and was eventually covered over altogether. That was actually, in fact, not the end of it because in 1848, an accumulation of gas from putrefying wastes in the fleet blew up. Uh, houses were inundated and the inhabitants of three workhouses were deluged with a wave of sewage. <coughs> Liquid history repeating itself, we might say. And the Thames soon deteriorated again in face of renewed population growth, setting a pattern of pollution and partial recovery that was to re be repeated over and over again through the centuries as different styles of management were attempted and failed in the growing metropolis. Although there's no record of monitoring pollution in the Thames that goes back much beyond the 20th century, some indications about the water quality can be obtained from the observations made about fish. Ah, I think I've missed a slide, beg your pardon. Sorry, I meant to include this uh, image, uh, this little extract from Samuel Pepys's diary, um, uh, which indicates some of the problems when you don't have a waterborne sewage system. If you just, I'll just pause, I'm not going to read it out, but go for the bottom but one line. It's great, isn't it? Um, what I would draw your attention to is the date. And the real reason I put this in, it's today. Oh. Thursday the 28th of uh, September, uh, 352 years ago, I think. Um, anyway, there we go. Um, we'll perhaps come back to that in a minute. Um, what I do want to talk about, though, was um, not only the growth of London, which we see in this slide here, this image from the dark area, which was the, uh, the position when uh, uh, around Pepys's time, and then the gradual growth, the lighter and lighter grey colours to the present day, or at least the 1990. Um, so let's uh, return to this issue about uh, monitoring. Oh, yes, I beg your pardon. I also have a picture of, of uh, this is the, the lower part of the fleet and the Thames that um, Christopher Wren tried to, uh, tried to encourage his civic pride by producing this sort of mini canal scene. It, it, it didn't work. Okay, so there we, have, uh, there we have the Thames after the reconstruction or after the fire of London. Very busy river. Okay, now, as I said, there's no record of monitoring pollution in the Thames that goes much back much beyond the 20th century. But some indications of water quality can be obtained from observations made about the fish. Fish from the tidal Thames were an important part of all Londoners' diets for many centuries, 
and catching them obviously provided work for hundreds of local people. The chart that I've got up here so, shows some of the observations of salmon, trout, grayling, perch, carp, tench, etc., 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 pike, eels, lampreys, very important, oysters, mussels, and prawns in the salt water zones, uh, uh, sorry, in the freshwater, and, and sorry, the um, um, sole, place, skate, halibut, oysters, mussels, and prawns in the salt water zones up at least until the start of the 19th century. Salmon, in particular, this salmon, a valuable and tasty fish, and ones which require both clean water and access to and from the sea, through which they travel long distances bef before returning to their native spawning grounds. Even up until the middle of the 19th century, barbel, chub and flounders were apparently being caught off London Bridge. The indications from these fish and from the story that is told here, uh, I just put in the, the thing here, 1457, which is probably not typical. Two whales, a walrus and a narwhal, allegedly were recovered from the Thames. Um, but certainly that's not typical, but many other fish appear to be typical and suggest that pollution in the Thames was rather localised, at least until the 18th century, and it was focused on where the tributaries entered the mainstream. However, that state of grace didn't last much longer, as a number of environmental changes, damaging environmental changes, took place almost simultaneously. The 19th century saw the Industrial Revolution, the manufacture of town gas that released phenols and ammonia into local watercourses, the growth of the population of London, the manufacture of town gas I've talked about, um, it released ammonia and uh, unpleasant volatile substances into the water. The other thing that happened was the growth of population from a million in 1801 to about two or three million in 1851. So that was the second thing, the growth of population, and you can see there how sudden and rapid it was. This is probably a diagram that's very familiar to people. Um, it's the population that's really critical here. This is, a, uh, this is the Great Fire when people moved out of London, but uh, we have this sudden exponential rise in the early part of the 19th century. Um, the other thing that happened was the widespread adoption of the flushing water closet, the toilet. Now, the latter was the real killer of the fish. In earlier times, a rudimentary waterborne sewerage system had been used, which may have worked insofar as avoiding having night soil men collecting tubs of human waste or excrement being left lying around in the streets and yards is concerned. They prevented the situation described by Pepys, of course. Um, water closets clearly had an advantage in allowing at least a modicum of privacy and security for the most private of personal functions. But for the water quality in the Thames, flushing lavatories rapidly became an environmental catastrophe. Raw sewage entered the streams and seeped into the ground everywhere as the city grew. Smaller streams were covered over to render them invisible, if not lacking in pungency. Lacking a comprehensive and functional piped sewer system, a sanitation system, London houses were soon literally floating on a sea of toxic excrement in the ground, and the wells and springs that watered the city became even less fit to drink. Basements flooded with contaminated water, and such sewers as existed repeatedly overflowed into the Thames, despite some attempts to treat some of their contents by trapping the fluid and allowing solid matter to settle out. Such solids as were recovered were then taken down the river by barge and dumped in the estuary. A management system, which some of you may be aware, persisted until the late 20th century. On high tides, or in dry periods when there was less fresh water coming down the river, much of the sewage just washed straight back up the river. And by the 1850s, this situation was unbearable. Firstly, it became unbearable in Bermondsey and Southwark, homes of the poorer sort who probably didn't matter too much, but then gradually more widely. When paddle steamers approached in the river, we're told that people fled because of the release of noxious sulphur dioxide from what was euphemistically called silt 
on the riverbed. Faraday, a famous scientist, is shown in this cartoon. He noted in July 1855, when he was on a barge on the river, that the whole area of water between London and Hungerford bridges, so not so far from where we are now, was opaque, pale brown fluid, feculence rolled up in clouds so dense that they were visible at the surface, the smell was very bad, the whole river was for a time a real sewer. I do not think I could have gone on to Lambeth or Chelsea. It's a putrescent pond through London. Now, for the last few years, there'd been a series of disagreements about how to cope with the growing calamity. And I want, really, to, to prompt you here to think about contemporary parallels. Commission after commission was established, each resigning acrimoniously as their own drainage system, their pet scheme, was rejected as being either too expensive or unfeasible, or that the proposed new sewer outfalls were too close to the property of those on the commissions or in a position to influence them. And the crunch, as some of you will be aware, came in the hot, dry summer of 1858, when this silt along the sides of the Thames became a bubbling, reeking ooze as a result of over 70 sewer outlets discharging human waste directly into the river. And the smell was so strong that Parliament could not sit at Westminster. Now, I don't propose to go into the detail of how Joseph uh, Bazalgette became the lead engineer in a scheme to install new interceptor sewers taking the contents of those overloaded foul sewers into larger pipes along the river margin, draining it further down the estuary prior to discharging the water again to the Thames during ebb tides. So they were waiting for the tide to go out, then they release it. Okay? This, is, this is the cartoon, obviously, uh, and you can see here that here's uh, uh, Sir Joseph and uh, the, the engineering works along the embankment putting in these large sewers that would, the idea was that they would trap the contents of material being washed down these small subsidiary streams. It was a remarkable example of Victorian engineering, but I do want to emphasise that this scheme was not actually what we would call today the best available technology. That's a term used by environmental uh, technologists. It wasn't the best available technology, even at the time. As a result of pressure from the government, the cost of the scheme was reduced by maintaining overflows between the foul water system and the surface water sewers that took rainwater to the Thames. So in heavy rainfall, the foul water sewers took in water from the ground and in roofs that had been connected in, in too large a quantity to be accommodated. That is, they were designed to overflow. Bazalgette had wanted complete separation of foul and surface water. But the, what the proponents of this cheaper scheme said was that during rainstorms, this sewage, this overflowing sewage, would be diluted and very inoffensive, so discharging it direct to the Thames within the city boundary would not matter, and it would cut the required size and cost of any subsequent treatment plants too. Beyond that, further reductions in costs were obtained by not taking the pipes too far and building the holding stations, those points waiting for the ebb tide, relatively close to the city at Beckton and Cross Ness. I'm sure you may have seen uh, pictures of the types of engineering that was involved. It was very substantial, very Victorian, and rather wonderful, in fact. Um, so, and here's the Cross Ness works, uh, a holding works, basically, uh, finished in 1865, and designed to allow most of the water to go, at that point, into the river at low tide, or as the tide was going out. Uh, it was, uh, the system was built to take the sewage of 3.5 million people, and the foul water sewers, the sewers that were coming from houses, water closets and so on, um, were sized to accommodate twice the average flow from those houses before they overtopped and flowed into the Thames. 
So, as I said, it started to operate in 1865. It was a remarkable turn of speed to get it constructed, and it demonstrated, apparently, the success of vision, radical engineering, and public investment, albeit at the lowest cost. You've probably guessed it, though. Before long, the complaints about the Metropolitan Board of Works operations started to come in again, initially from residents in Barking who found unpleasant silt accumulating around the outfalls, and they sued. The board actually escaped being fined on a technicality, but the Thames water remained putrid. And by the 1880s, there were continuing complaints of nausea, smell, headaches, and dead fish over a 25-kilometre reach of the river. Further reports were commissioned, which suggested, of course, that the Thames was not actually injurious to health, it was just only a nuisance. I can't help thinking it was likely to have been a cover-up. A few improvements were made to, a, to the arrangements prior to discharging the sewage in the, into the Thames by allowing some accelerated settlement of the solids using various chemicals, and there was a little evidence, some small evidence, of fish starting to return. However, by this point, scientific evidence about the river itself was starting to accumulate. The Thames itself was a local source of drinking water for many Victorian Londoners, as it is today, who, in return for paying private water companies for supplies of very dubious quality indeed, were often the recipients of downright lies, or at least alternative facts, about its characteristics. The map here shows the areas served on the north and south banks of the river, and if any of you are London residents, you might be able to have a hazard a guess as to where your, your own property is within those old water company areas. The tabulation, um, the tabulation here shows how much water particular households received from the different companies. Sometimes the figures on the right hand side there look uh, quite large, they look quite large, um, but these were, of course, large households. Many people, of course, at this time, or a number of people at this time, were not paying for their water, or, or they were collecting it themselves, still from standpipes and so on, and pumps. Um, the water provided by these water companies, you can see the names of them down the left-hand side here, and, and the, their dates of foundation. The top one, actually, is... Uh, some of you may know, is not uh, water coming from within the Thames. It's water that was brought into the Thames from the New River in Hertfordshire, through the New River in Hertfordshire, by Sir Hugh Middleton uh, sometime before this, and um, uh, was supplying a lot of houses by then. But the other ones, from Chelsea on down, are all companies providing water by pumping it out of the Thames, quite close to where the outfalls were. The water was filtered through sand columns before being piped to these houses, and it was allegedly safe to drink. Although its quality and colour, and apparently it was light green when seen in volume, I'm looking at this now in a new light, um, it was uh, it, the volume and the colour, sorry, the quality and the colour did vary with the volume of fresh water in the river, so the quality varied. But you'll remember the complaints. And uh, I don't know whether any of you know this. This is the, the Mudlark pub in Southwark, named after the people who used to scavenge those silt, silt banks at the side of the river. Um, um, the, um, in 1896, there was an analytical investigation from a series of what would be called today independent consultants and it cast doubt on what was being said by these private water companies. The companies had published statistics showing that although the water was described as wholesome, and it was said that it had no suspended solids in it, and in fact I have looked at some of the records for these, and every single one of the tests in the, in the column for suspended, sediment, said it, suspended solids, it says none. Um, in fact, it turned out, as a result of the uh, report here that was done in 1896, that the solids had simply been ignored by the analysts 
The water also contained horrific levels of microorganisms, bacteria mainly, which were injurious to health and which had not been filtered out. These private companies lied. This is um, actually a page taken out of that report, which I photographed, and um, you can see here, this is um, year by year, as you go along the, uh, year, along the bottom axis here, year by year, from 1894 through 1895, this was the results of the analysis that was done subsequently. And it, this one is particularly showing organic matter present in the water. And I can tell you now, I wouldn't like to be drinking that one, and I wouldn't actually like to be drinking any of these either. Um, of course, cartoons abounded, and some of you will have seen this one. Microscopy was just getting... Uh, interested, uh, interesting for the general public, and uh, there we see somebody looking at what might be in the water. Um, so these private companies lied. Now, I asked you to draw parallels with what goes on today, and that's a, an interesting question which I may come back to at the end. So, in the meantime, the population of London continued to grow. The results of continuing to use the Bazalgette system became more obvious. After the 1890s, a regular river water sampling, was system, uh, sampling system was established, although it didn't happen very frequently. And I have a series of diagrams here that show some of the science of what was happening in the river during the 20th century. Dissolved oxygen is one of the most important characteristics of the health of water, as it's a basic requirement for fish and shellfish life. In the period after 1890, when it had been improving a little, to 1950, this oxygen levels plummeted. So here we've got, a long, whoop, along the bottom here, we've got the period from about 1890 through to about 1970. And here's the dissolved oxygen curve in the summer or autumn when it was probably worst. And you can see by 1950 what had happened. The dissolved oxygen levels in the water had reached zero, effectively. To, to um, Bazalgette's credit, in fact, the interceptor sewer system he had designed was intended only to cope with a population of three and a half million. And it had partly succeeded in that, but it had subsequently been overwhelmed by the circumstances. The worst situation was around London Bridge, below which the increased dilution from the seawater offered some improvement. So what we see here is, um, this is going along the river, where zero here in the middle, this is the position of London Bridge here, and um, these are various dates showing what happened in the period uh, slightly earlier through to 1950, when, uh, the 1950s, when you can see that as you go down the river from 20, 20 kilometres above London Bridge, here's London Bridge going through for 20 kilometres below before there's any improvement at all. So we've got 40 or 50 kilometres of the river that is biologically, basically dead. This is probably well within the lifetimes of many of the people sitting in the audience today. The continued growth of the city's population, um, according to research by uh, the research here done by the Natural History Museum, um, produces what this is what is called a sag in oxygen saturation. At the yeah, so here's a, a similar diagram focusing in really on that period from 1920 through to 1950, lower down the river, and again you can see the autumn period where the, the curves, um, um, at the measurements there, this one uh, at uh, Gravesend, uh, Beckton and Crossness, the dissolved oxygen dropping and dropping and dropping. So by 1950, as I said, it's effectively zero. It's a little bit better further downstream. London, of course, looked like this at the time. The... Um, it's an industrial scene. These some wonderful photographs in some of the uh, London County Council, as it was um, then produced, uh, associated with their planning strategy. 
but uh, not only were discharges from sewage treatment plants and industrial effluents making the water noisome and certainly undrinkable, but hot water from power station cooling towers and noise from bankside and river-based operations had created an ecological nightmare. Adding further to this was the increased use of synthetic detergents, use of which peaked in the 1960s, and increasing the loads on some of the recently added treatment plants, which became effectively overwhelmed. This is, uh, this is the point where you remember I talked about barges taking sludge down the river and dumping it into the river. This is the point at which, uh, or um, uh, mucking flats was where it was um, disposed of here. And you can see immediately here the effect there on, uh, on, the, on the quality of water at the point at which it's discharged into the river. The diagram also shows, oh, this diagram, sorry, that's, again, overflows sort of thing that was being observed. You can see there the foam. This is foam from um, synthetic detergents in the 1950s. And uh, there's the pattern of use of synthetic detergents taking off after the Second World War when people, women particularly, I don't suppose men did, but women discovered OMO, for example, and Tide. Okay. Um, of course, the river was still used by lots of people and enjoyed by lots of people. I, I kind of think, uh, you know, look at, sitting looking at it is probably one thing, or standing looking at it. The lads of Eton College clearly are made of sterner stuff because um, they were still boating in it at that time. And lower down, there you see the typical industrial scene and some of these mud flats where mud larking, collecting, <laughs> collecting somewhat valuable items from the sewage that dropped by the side of the river was still taking place. Here's an example. This diagram shows you the effect of one sewage treatment plant, new one, a newish one that was built, Mogden, uh, built in the 20th century. This, is the, this parameter here is biological oxygen demand, which is actually the amount of oxygen that's going to be needed by the water to break down sewage that's in it. So it's kind of it's the hunger of the water for sewage. And you can see what's happening here. The water, uh, biological oxygen demand, is a parameter that you want to keep low. And obviously by the 1970s, and uh, there's some particular spikes here in the 1960s, but generally, biological oxygen demand is going up and up and up in the out, uh, outflows from this particular sewage works. As I say, it didn't prevent people using it, and nor did um, ammonia in the metropolitan outfalls uh, either in the 1950s. Here you can see ammonia, again from sewage, just below those two outfalls, levels very high. Basically, the river is full of wee. Something new was clearly going to be required to address the problem. But what came along was another round of unproven technology and more legislation. In the half century since 1950, there have undoubtedly been some improvements in water quality. Legislation required industrial premises to stop emitting untreated discharges unless they were licensed. And the quality of their effluents had to be improved and the volumes reduced. And if you look at this, diagram here, the yellow area is industrial effluent, and you see from the 1950s through to the end of the 20th century, indeed, the volumes did get smaller and smaller. However, in fact, industry was already closing down in central London, and gas manufacturing had ceased, so that problem was disappearing anyway. Now, subsequently, Legislation from Europe has removed some of the most obvious contaminants, such as particular pesticides and herbicides that are resistant to breakdown. But other improvements, as I said, have been more serendipitous. More recently, the rapid shift from photographic printing, for example, caused a massive reduction in toxic silver compounds in wastewater without requiring any legislation at all. 
Sewage treatment plants in the 1960s experimented with some new technologies to allow biological processes to act on the wastewater prior to discharging it into the river. And research was undertaken on flows in the river, both fresh water and salt, to try and establish where the worst problems lay and why. But the lack of investment in the facilities, at least to the extent required to address the problem, remained significant through to the 1980s and beyond. Now, 30 years ago or thereabouts, a major shift in thinking took place that ultimately took the management of water, both clean and dirty, out of the hands of local authorities and public institutions and back into the hands of private companies. You'll remember we talked about that earlier. We're trying that again. The underlying idea was simple, to prevent the financial investment that seemed to be required to sort out water quality problems from appearing on the public expenditure balance sheet. Again, time doesn't permit us to explore the details, but there have been improvements in the quality of the water overall, upgrading and rebuilding of sewage treatment plants, and some other activities too. This is artificially aerating in the 1950s, the Thames with a, uh, with a, a mechanical means, sort of chopping up the water, and that's still going on. If you look, on the, uh, uh, if you look for the Thames bubbler on your phone, you'll find a, a nice little app that shows you where this machine is in the Thames. Quite often it's moored, but often it's going up and down the Thames, bubbling water into the surface of the Thames. There are actually two of them. You can, as you say, you can find out exactly where they, they are on an app, should that be of interest. There are these stubborn problems, and that's a very curious way, to my mind, to approach them. There are problems with pollution incidents. This is just a few, it's the tail end of the 20th century. Many, many pollution incidents, and that continues. There are, despite some of the protestations of people, that the Thames is improving in its quality. This is a wonderful picture of uh, Peter Black, the chairman of Thames Water Authority, which is at that point a public institution, uh, alleging that the, the salmon were coming back. I always think it's rather sad that it's a dead one that he's holding. Wouldn't it have been nicer to leave it in the river? That was in 1974. Um, but, uh, and, and there has been some evidence that some salmon are coming back. That's the period... Uh, the later part of the 20th century again, showing you confirmed sightings of salmon in the Thames estuary um, up to 1995, but there are not very many of them. There are more and more fish species reappearing too. This is, uh, this is just the early period. I wanted to illustrate for you that after uh, the 1950s and the, some of the investment there, some species came back quite quickly, and in fact 97 species of fish were recorded uh, in the lower parts from Fulham to Gravesend um, in a particular year. But there are very stubborn problems. We know from biological indicator species that the long-term history, or the long-term ecology of the river is not in a good state. Um, I'll come back to uh, one of those in a minute, but we also know that there are sediment, uh, there are metals in sediments in the river that every time the river stirs up, every time the water stirs at the bottom, get releases, released. This is some uh, tin, a tin compound associated with um, shipping that's found in the water below Teddington uh, and going through, the, through central London. Here's London Bridge here. Again, you see it's still more or less peaking here. There's a little peak up here for some reason, boating at, at Kew and Richmond probably, but again you can see there that the, the high levels around London Bridge. Um, that's tin, but there's also copper, zinc, phosphorus, compounds and so on, which arrive in the water partly still through unknown routes, some from upstream farming, some from shipping, and some from local chemical releases. We are just discovering, and this is very recent, we are just discovering about microplastic particles uh, nanoscale particles which flush through the river in huge quantities and have not really been searched for previously. And we still get those accidents, as I discussed earlier. The problem is that we are still dependent, essentially, 
on the system installed by Bazalgette in the mid-19th century for the principles on which the waste system operates. Had a separate sewage system been installed, as Bazalgette originally suggested, the situation might not have been as bad as it is today. And with the further increases in population, now to about 8 million people, the system arguably cannot cope. I want to just finish off... Yeah, sorry, that's mean concentrations of metals in the livers of eel populations. So there are still eels in the Thames estuary, or there were at the end of the 20th century, uh, but they, their livers contain large quantities of things which are toxic. Um, of course, it's very sad for the eels because you have to kill them to find out what's in their livers, which also doesn't do the ecology very, good, uh, very much good. Um, however, good points. The current situation for, for wildlife is challenging. The Thames is home to some increasing, uh, interesting species, such as harbour and grey seals, who live in the estuary, and a wide range of birds. Wildlife dependent on Thames water having been made virtually extinct in the 1950s, and again in the, uh, sorry, in the 1850s, and again in the 1950s, some recovery is now taking place. And research by ZSL, the zoo, is exploring this. And you can, in fact, participate yourself. We know that eels seem to have returned to the Thames since about 2005, but they're still critically endangered, not only by poor water quality, but by hundreds of barriers to their progress up and down the river. Despite the optimism of the 1970s, salmon are not yet reliably established in the river and presumably this situation will not be assisted by catching them for exhibition either. They're probably not now being poisoned, but the periodic flushes of contaminated water keep the overall health of the river at a very low level, and they reduce the feeding opportunities for birds, for seals, and so on. And alarmingly, the presence of hormones derived from contraceptives in the Thames water also gives cause for concern. This is almost untouched by current treatment technologies. Attempts to reintroduce shellfish colonies into the estuary from populations in Cornwall, so you take the shellfish from Cornwall and see if you can re-establish them in the Thames, have resulted in the uprooted creatures growing inappropriate body parts, for example. Basically, the female ones grew penises, okay, which is not really a good situation to have. The latest technology... Uh, sorry, there's uh, mammal sightings. Yes, there we are. Mammal marine sightings it do seem to be going up, so that's good. The latest technology attempt to address the problem of water quality, poor water quality in the Thames Tideway is the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is another interceptor scheme, albeit on a vast scale. Again, we don't have insufficient time to explore this scheme in detail, but in simple terms, it's an upgraded version of Bazalgette's scheme that will catch more water from sewers before that water reaches the Thames. But it will not stop rainwater getting into those sewers in the first place at the top of the system. It's vastly expensive and ambitious, and like the other ones, the earlier ones, it's a testament to some very clever engineering. But sadly, the periodic review of the scheme undertaken by the UK's National Audit Office in March this year concluded that it wasn't good value. It's still being built, of course. They particularly criticised the time taken to develop measurable standards and the, the lack of consideration of different options for actually dealing with the problem itself. And they noted that some of the evidence used was better than others. They also noted that the eventual cost to customers, those living in the Thames catchment area, the whole Thames catchment area, and paying the water bills were uncertain. Obviously, I cannot say if the scheme will work in the medium term, but in the long term, I'm doubtful that it will be the final solution. There are some interesting parallels with past situations where legislation, science, technology, engineering, and public protests have failed to deliver consistent improvements to the quality of the water. Perhaps what we are seeing here is yet another cycle of up and down in the quality of water in the Thames, with the next downturn driven by shifts in our climate. I'll end 
with this very cute seal who is concerned about the Thames Tideway Tunnel. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.